button. Okay. I'll be good now. Yeah. <laughs> Behave myself. Uh-huh. Welcome, welcome, you guys. We'll get started here in just a minute. Takes a few for everybody to get loaded in. Beth and I are going to be on our best behavior now that you guys are listening to us. <laughs> she did it because Amy started the record button. So now I have to behave for the rest of the hour. <laughs> yep. You have to last an hour. Oh, goodness. I know it says 1230, but we'll give it a few more seconds here for folks to get in. Okay. People will join us as they can. I know this is a crazy time of the year and of the day, but welcome, welcome to uh, KCC Lunch and Learn. We are super excited that you chose to join us on this beautiful day. Some of you might be sitting outside and I certainly wouldn't blame you. This is Chamber of Commerce weather. Um, so enjoy it uh, while you can, of course. Um, I'm Amy Cloud. I'm the Executive Director of the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce Executives Association. I'm so excited to have my colleague and friend, Beth Davison. She's the Vice President of Workforce Development for the Kentucky Chamber. She oversees our amazing Workforce Center. And um, if you think you all have been busy with workforce issues, can you imagine what Beth has been like? Uh, it's been, she's been in the, the center uh, of the stage with the spotlight on her for the last 18 months, even before that, lots of work, but because of everything that's been happening in our world, um, she's at the center of it all. So we're super excited that she gave us an hour today to uh, share her expertise about the crisis that's going on. Um, I will say this much, if you do have a question, please put it in the chat box. Um, I'll be monitoring that as does Beth. She's pretty tech savvy too. So she can check the chat box with us. Um, but I do have questions that I'm going to pose to Beth and to get the conversation started. Um, a reminder to you guys that we are recording um, our Lunch and Learn. We do that with the entire series. If you would like to see this again or like to share it with someone, excuse me, you will find it on our KCCE YouTube channel. Um, and I'll be happy to share that um, uh, link with you guys when we get uh, when we get uh, at the end. Um, it's easy to find on YouTube. Um, and like I said before, too, if you have questions, just make sure you put them in the chat box. Um, so we'll get things started, Beth. Um, is there anything else you need to say? Did I introduce you? Is there anything else you want to add? <laughs> no, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Amy, Amy knows this. I mean, you all know this. Like anytime you get a chance to partner with Amy Cloud, you take it because she has got the best vibe about her. She's just so fun to be around and she's smart. So um, okay. I'm just really grateful to be here today. I'm also very, you introduced me very kindly. I feel okay. over the last year, my nickname has become the girl that nags the government to do things for workforce and to change things. So thank you. Uh, for well, we're happy to have you i mean no better person than you and your sunny disposition to vote the governor <laughs> it's better you than me <laughs> um the first thing to start us off and this is kind of a broad question but it'll get the conversation started what do you see is the main issue or issues for the workforce crisis that we find ourselves in what's yeah. behind all this it's huge i mean there's so much and we're, we're going to just make today conversational and try to make some sense of this complete crisis that we're in, because I, it, we are in a workforce crisis, make no mistake about it. Um, and I think we could all appreciate that now it feels like we're a bit shell-shocked. It's, it's easy to look back and, and, and now I'm like, what just happened? Where were we? Something that big that comes along once every hundred years, we're in for it. Right. I mean, there is going to be a lot to clean up and I we're just now getting to the workforce crisis part piece of it. And this this workforce crisis that's currently happening is the biggest economic crisis we're facing. It's the biggest issue of the day for all of our members right now. It arguably was before the pandemic. It certainly is now. Um, but we've been doing the best we can for the last year and a half, and all of you all have too, to fight for our members, to keep our citizens alive and healthy. And we're, we're really just getting to the, the crisis, the, the economic and workforce fallout of that. And right now, first before the economic one, uh, we're definitely in the workforce crisis. And I, mm -hmm. I think we can 
we can almost bet that once you have benefits get turned off in August, we're going to start to see the economic fallout. I don't, I don't, I don't know everything, but I don't think we've seen the economic fallout from COVID yet. Mm -hmm. I think it's yet to remain because we're sitting on a bit of a a propped up economy. Mm -hmm. Um, But when you look at, you know, workforce in general and what's happening, there's a couple outliers that, that tell us the story and, you know, with workforce, it's complex. It's never just one thing. It's, it's a combination of a, a lot of different issues or gaps or opportunities that, you know, we need to look at. So, you know, in Kentucky, um, right now, our workforce participation rate completely plummeted in the middle of the COVID crisis. And it, and it really is struggling right now. And labor force participation means active citizens, you know, healthy citizens, working age adults that could be working, but they're, they're currently not. Um, Mm -hmm. And they're not in a job search. They've just, they've stopped participating in the workforce altogether. Um, And when we look at that, you know, Kentucky's not doing well. We're, we're 48th in the nation among 50 states. We we were fiftieth at one point. We were we were last in the country, but you know, unfortunately, I as we say, thank God for West Virginia and and Mississippi. Uh, we're now at forty eight. Um, and you know, when you look at all of our border states, aside from West Virginia, they're kicking our tails when it comes to workforce participation. And so, reason you know people aren't participating. It's complex again. It. It, some of it definitely has to do with the, the UI benefits, um, you know, right now. I mean, to some degree, our members, our businesses are competing with the government for employees. On average right now in Kentucky, you can make $17.50 an hour by not working. So think about that in terms of also the complex and severe child care issues which are happening in our state right now. People, mm-hmm. I truly do not believe people are being lazy. I think they're being logical. I think they're doing a logical thing. Their childcare is completely scarce right now. I mean, all of us could probably relate to that, those issues. And if you don't have a childcare system to rely on, it's, you can't go back right now. It's too hard. So we see, obviously the UI payments are are impacting the workforce. Childcare issues are still very real. And we we project that that will remain until hopefully fall when school gets back in session. And then the other big component that, that a lot of us didn't maybe see coming would have as big of an impact as it is, is what we call the quitters. So there was a lot of soul searching during the pandemic, right? I mean, we all went through something very major. There was a lot of people that, because of that, that quit jobs, that moved into other careers, that retired, that are traveling the world. My neighbor owns a a company where he redoes RV buses and and makes them homes. Um, And they've they've moved on either to another workplace or, or they've just, they've quit. Um, and so that's, that actually is a, a pretty major factor that we're seeing. And do you think those people that you said like quit, do you, mm-hmm. are they going to, will we see a resurgence of that group when the UI um, benefits go away? Or do you feel like people have just, are they figuring out how to do something? I mean, how they still have bills, you yeah. know, but so when the UI quits, are we going to see a resurgence? Do you think? Or is it going to be something gradual? I'm just curious to know what it's going to look like, like in September when they're not getting that check from the government anymore. Um, Are we going to be overwhelmed with people looking for jobs? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really good question and something to think about. It's unpredictable, just like all COVID's been. You know what I mean? Like we've, (laughs) we've, we've all been battling day by day of what's the new crisis of the day. Crisis management, by the way, my friends should never have to last, uh, 15 months, you know, but here we are. Um, Mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't know that we can say what, what the world will look at like when those UI benefits get turned off in August. So, so done in September. I mean, I think it's, it's reasonable to hope and, and to, to think, of course, people are going to come back. I mean, they, they, they're going to have to get that money. So I think we'll see a resurgence of workers at that time, but to your point of like, well, will they go to other industries? I think absolutely. I think definitely in the healthcare space, we're seeing demand projections for healthcare communities that there's jobs, you know, a lot of people got burnt out. I, I could not have worked in that field. 
um, after what they just went through. And a lot of people are, are feeling that burnout and it's real and they've moved on to other careers outside of nursing, uh, for example. Um, you know, and I think other people just, again, did some soul searching and, and are moving on to, to different career fields and, and making the most of what they want in their life. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a, I mean, it was a eye-opening experience, whether what you got from it, whether it's about your family and your priorities or your health or your job or mental well-being or whatever may be. I think you did give us some time to step back, but some people really did step back. And you and I were chatting earlier, you know, even the even the team workers. I mean, when when I was a teenager, nobody paid me more than minimum wage to do anything. Yeah. And now you see like Chick-fil-A offering 15 and $18 an hour to teen workers. That seems outrageous. I know. <laughs> but you I know, know, I mean, and you wonder why the chicken sandwich is going up. It's because they've got to, they've got to pay for it some way. So yeah. that's what makes me nervous when, you know, even when you talk about getting rid of the UI um, and what's going to happen with our economy, the inflation numbers, if you think you're paying someone to work at a fast food restaurant, almost double or more than double minimum wage, then what's that going to mean for the food from the fast food restaurant? It's going to be the same as a sit down restaurant. So yep. it's no longer the concept of inexpensive fast food. It's, it's fast maybe, but it's not inexpensive anymore. So yeah, no, 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 that, that's I've thought about that. The, but it costs to feed my family at the drive through uh, It's amazing now. There's four of us. Granted, I have a growing teenage boy, but, you know, it's amazing that it's at least 40 bucks whenever we go to a fast food restaurant, you know, yeah, $10 a piece easy. It's, it, you know, it's, it's interesting that the workforce issues now, they're so bad. They are having an absolute impact on consumers. Mm -hmm. And this in my lifetime, since I've been in workforce, we've never seen that level of severity from exactly what you're saying. It's like the war on the chicken sandwich just got way more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we saw what happened with, oh gosh, Del was it Delta? Uh, no, American, American Airlines. American canceled flights. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They, they canceled flights um, because there's not a workforce shortage. We're seeing gas. Um, not making its deliveries. And that's going to, that's going to continue to compound over the summer, not because there's a shortage of gasoline or oil. It is because there is a shortage of drivers, CDL licensed drivers to get that gas where it needs to go. And on top of that, you know, just products not being available, services having, you having to wait longer for services, inflation mm -hmm. prices going up. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I think on top of that, like, and I, I don't want to be doom and gloom. I just, I want to be realistic that we're still in the middle of co like the COVID crisis. It's just now moving into the economic and workforce crisis yeah. um, that, you know, once those payments get turned off, like we are, we are really sitting in a propped up economy right now. And there's no way around it. I mean, when you have that millions of extra dollars coming from those UI payments getting put into our economy every week, Right now it is very, it's propped up and it's, it's not a real economy um, because it's being subsidized. And I, and I hate that, I know this is a little bit off workforce, but I hate that so many people are not educated as to what that means for them. Yeah. They just think they're getting checks from the government and whether they got UI or not, but they're getting the, you know, the, the check if they make under 150,000 for, you know, and then you get early, the early credit for child, the child credit for taxes now. And people don't understand if you take the early credit, then you don't get it on your taxes. It's like people, the information is out there, but people aren't getting educated on what all these extra checks from the government mean. Do they think it's just on a money tree? I mean, we're going to have to repay that some way. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to be accountable for that if you take one of those checks. So Anyway, I'm just a little nervous about this fall. It's a, I mean, <laughs> no it's, better time than a daughter to start college, right? Then, when yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, she does get need to get that post secondary education. Uh, it will protect her from hopefully the next pandemic. Um, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what you mentioned a little bit about stopping UI payments, that sort of thing, and that you bug the governor hmm. and government about how things are working with getting people back to work. What are, are there appropriate steps that the state and federal government are taking um, to change yeah. the current culture? And if they, if, if you feel that there's some appropriate steps that are happening, share with us what, what those are. Yeah. Educate us on what those steps are to help with this. 
I think, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's, it, we got, we too, we have to understand like, it's more than just stopping payments. I mean, the, the, the issues, the, the childcare issues are still very, very, very real. I mean, pre pandemic and, and not a lot of people know this, but almost 50% of Kentucky citizens were living in what we call a childcare desert, which means that fit almost 50% of Kentuckians pre pandemic didn't have access to childcare or quality childcare. Um, so that, you know, keeps, people out of the workforce, what we've mainly mm -hmm. seen is women, but it also means that 50% of Kentucky kids show up not prepared for kindergarten. Um, so it has a huge, huge lasting impacts. And so what we're seeing, you know, is that we need a multi-pronged approach. Um, and there's a couple of things. Childcare has got to be figured out. That is a mm -hmm. federal, a state, and a private uh, partnership. It's not going to be a band-aid. One, it's it's going to have to be a multifaceted. Everybody stands up and gets it done. Mm -hmm. By way of resources, we also have to consider, and this I think is something really. And I know you asked, like, well, what can local chambers do? Like, what should what should we be thinking about? And I think this is a huge opportunity. We are seeing a historic influx of resources coming in from the federal government by way of the American Rescue Plan Act, the ARPA funds, and the CARES Act. We've never, as a country, and I don't, I don't even think again in our, and I hope, you know, we'll never go through something like this again in our lifetime. I don't even think we're going to see this again in our lifetime. We've never seen this much money come into local, state governments, workforce agencies, schools, not in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. That to me means that's a humongous opportunity if we know how to spend those funds appropriately. So what kind of keeps me up at night is how do we build an a workforce that will support the economy? So for, you know, I've, I've been asking local and state leaders, how are you all spending those, that funds? How, how are you making sure, however you're investing in schools, investing in workforce training, that it really meets the needs of economy? And here's why that's so important. You know, in the next five years, 20% of all of our jobs in the South that require just that high school degree will be gone because automation is taking over. Technology is now advancing at a rate that is much faster because of the pandemic. Employers don't have the workers. They need the technology to get the jobs done. And, and then we also got more reliant on technology throughout the pandemic. And so this insertion of uh, technological advancements, automation in the workforce that we thought was five to 10 years from now is coming, going to be coming much sooner. In Kentucky, that means we're going to leave our citizens behind that don't have higher levels of credentials, school, post-secondary schooling, training that goes beyond that high school degree. Um, and that's terrifying. And so when you think about the ARPA funds, the CARES fund, my question, and I, I hope it's all of our questions to our local leaders in education, in workforce, in government, how are we spending those ARPA funds? Just ask, just ask the question. How are we spending all those federal funds that are coming in? How? And see if it's chamber leaders as, as individuals like, like us that we all represent the economy. Does, will that build the workforce that we need? Will that build the workforce that the economy really needs? And if we can do that, we will be building a workforce that they're going to be more successful because they're trained up and skilled up in the way businesses need. So I think the number one thing that all of us can be doing right now is asking local leaders, how are you spending that money? Can I get you some insight from business? It, those are two humongous questions right now that we need to be asking. Um, just asking the questions. And, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to ask those questions and to get involved. It's, it's, not, um, it's not a good idea, and it might not even be fair to put that much responsibility. And I'm talking like trillions of dollars, hundreds of trillions of dollars coming into the state, millions and millions getting spread across Kentucky. It's not fair to think that one organization or one government agency or one K through 12 system just knows how to spend that, that money. If we're truly to be a community that 
want a healthy economy and a healthy workforce, we have to work with them to direct those funds in appropriate ways so that if we're investing in schools, we're doing it where kids are getting experiences that they need to make decisions about their careers. Um, if they're looking at future projections of the economy, are they looking with that at data? data are they making data-driven decisions and getting business insights for that? And that's what seemed kind of interesting to me, uh, just in one small piece of that pie is when monies are given to school systems, and even like our state legislature voted on the supplemental year, and how every school system was allowed to make their own decision and kind of within the boundaries of what that law looked like at the state level, each community got to make their own smaller rules underneath that. And I thought, you know, some communities, and this was just with schools, and this was just with that bill, wasn't even really, it was because of the pandemic, not so much workforce, but each school system got to make their own decisions on how they handled those students who got to come back for another year. Well, some students don't even get that opportunity. So I, I guess it makes me nervous too, that if if there's not a, a statewide like agreement that mm -hmm. some communities, as always, are left behind, whether it's the rural communities, certain regions of the state, whether it's the demographics that affect it or, you know, the economic status of it. I just hope that, I mean, and tell us, is there a way local chambers, how our, our, our local chamber professionals and their boards or their members are there programs that are already going where we need to we need to support? This needs to be like a an agreement across the state or across the country. Or I mean, like, how can they get engaged with that? I just luckily for us, our school system is on the better end of how things are doing for that supplemental year. But I mean, I, I'm a rural community, and I didn't know how that was going to all shake out because yeah. rural communities might not have the manpower or the wherewithal or want to take the time because their school, their student population is so small. They're like, oh, it won't make that big of a difference. Whereas like a Louisville or a Lexington, you know, that school system might've looked at it differently. Same thing goes with whatever programs you're figuring out for childcare or the programs that need to skill up, you know, our workforce. I just want to, I want to know if there's programs where we can make sure like all the boats are raised. Yeah. You know, that each community doesn't get to pick or certain communities are are chosen and other ones are left out. Yeah, no, I mean, all, the, the, the ARPA funds and the CARES Act funds, they are all going, most of them are local. So okay. they're all going to local communities, which I think leaves that excellent opportunity for local chamber leaders to stick their nose in and ask where the funds are going and then ask how they can help. Um, and I think there's a real case to be made that businesses should be business voice should be helping to lead the discussion on how those funds are being being spent. And here's why we talked about the workforce participation issues. But beyond that, like Kentucky got hit really, really, really hit. Our citizens got completely left behind and fared some of the worst in the country. So in terms of the pandemic, we were the fourth highest state for most unemployment claims oh. and jobs that are vulnerable, meaning they won't be coming back. Wow. So that, you know, Kentucky being in a top five state for that, we left a lot of our citizens are behind. And here's the ones we left behind, which to me, it's, it's just, you know, the, the pandemic continued to shine that light on our, our issues. And the people that we left behind are the ones we tend to tend to, tend to always leave behind. So uh, minorities are black and brown citizens, women, um, individuals that make under $35,000 a year, and individuals that have lower levels of education attainment. So in Kentucky, if you obtained a bachelor's degree, you were twice as likely to have kept your job. Um, so it's still worth it to pay for Kendall's college because it does, it does pay off. But in Kentucky, where... We do such a good job graduating high school, but past that, we leave. We don't, we, we don't do a great job at getting higher levels of education attainment, whether that's a certification, an associate, a bachelor's degree. And then you look at 
what technological advancements and automation is going to do to our state. Mm -hmm. We are in for some real challenges if we don't get our citizens into jobs that matter, that have career growth associated with them, that mean something to the economy. Uh, Because remember, I mean, when you do that for your citizens, they can earn higher levels of of income, Mm -hmm. higher levels of education, and then all those boats rise. Mm -hmm. But we only do that when we invest those funds in ways that really mean something to the economy. So if we're training up and investing in different K through 12 programs for career awareness experience, well, are businesses involved? Is the training training that really matters for our future economy or just today's jobs? And I would say the same goes for any kind of workforce training uh, program that's out there is that we really need to, to, to get business voice. And, you know, I'll, I'll put a plug in for our talent pipeline management program. It's touted as one of the best in the country to get business insight and talent pipeline management, TPM, as we lovingly call it, is open to any local chamber. We're working with a lot of local chambers on it now, but we've convened, you know, luckily, before the pandemic, between 2018 to 2020, we convened 27 employer collaboratives, which are groups of businesses that work together in, you know, they come from like industries, they're organized by region, and they project out like, here are the critical jobs I have. This is how many of those positions I need. And these are the positions my business can't run without. And then we take that data and we arm it at workforce resources and say, build these pipelines. These are the pipelines that will make your community and your economy bigger, better, faster, and stronger. And we get responses that way. And that's that's something that's, I think, very, very critical and needed when, you know, one of your local government says, well, what is business insight? I can almost guarantee you in most, in, in nine out of 10 regions in the state, we have critical workforce data. Um, and this is something that pours into our state system. I'll, I'll say one more thing and then I'll stop. Right now, our state, our state spends 1.2, this is pre-ARPA, forget federal funds, they're not in this equation, but so only imagine it's going to get bigger. Our state spends $1.2 billion a year in workforce training and education. And we do that with a 10% understanding of what businesses actually need. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> right. Because if we're going to spend all that money, yeah. we should skill up and educate. I mean, I think we do our best guess, you know what I mean? But we right. have very little business insight. <laughs> Talent pipeline management has helped shift that and that we send this demand data over to our, to our state. So the state's very open. I mean, they, 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 they partner with us on this program. They're huge, huge uh, funder and partner to us. They want the insights. They want business leadership, mm-hmm. um, but it does then take the, the business side of things for us as chamber leaders all across the state and businesses to step up and, and be at that table so that we can make better decisions together about the future of our workforce. Gotcha. So the statistics that you were talking about, the 10% of the one mm-hmm. something billion dollars. 1.2. Um, $1.2 billion. Um, can't forget that. Two billion point two is a lot of money. Um, uh, the, you think that be, through the talent pipeline management program, we're going to be able to grow that percentage. That money is still going to be oh, yeah. spent. We're still going to have those dollars. But our hopes is that we're going to grow that percentage knowing that we are placing or we're getting people in jobs greater than 10%, correct? Is that is that your point on that? That's exactly right. And I need okay. to get an updated that that 10% number was pre TPM, which right. talent pipeline management, which we put in t- talent pipeline management back in 2018. So I need to actually see what that number is now, but we've got hundreds of businesses that are involved in talent pipeline management, uh, building these pipelines. So they build them regionally and based on what those employers as a, as a combined unit, as an industry sector are saying that they need. Right. And, you know, that's why I'm poking around asking everyone now when they're spending all those, you know, thinking about how they're spending ARPA funds and CARES funds, like, how are you spending them? Um, and how much business in, input do you have? And so that's, it's just a very worthwhile question. And if you need data to point at them, we got it and it's free Absolutely. and it's open source and we're happy to send it. So let us well, know. And one of, well, yeah, one of my next questions, and you've kind of already covered it, but just to make sure folks understand, like resources that the Kentucky Chamber Workforce Center has that local communities can use. You talked about that data, but we have talent pipeline managers. 
So mm-hmm. kind of kind of cover that like in a nutshell. I know that's easier said than done. They're fabulous people that work at the Workforce Center. But explain how communities who don't have TPM already actively engaged, like what what's first steps for them? Because that is a huge resource in getting the numbers for your own community. You don't want to rely on just general state numbers. You want to know what's happening in your community or your region. And those folks are really getting at that. So tell tell us how we get TPM in our community. Yeah. So um thank you. One, my team is amazing. I'll I'll love it. So <laughs> they thank are. you. And they work really hard. And I get to stand up here and say nice a lot of good things that make me feel really smart, but it's honestly them like <laughs> grinding this out and doing all this incredible work every day. There are six of them across the state. Um, and they are divided by region. Um, and to Amy's point, like they're absolutely here to help us. We help mm-hmm. you. We have a very inclusive table where all are welcome. Um, and so with 27 different employer collaboratives, they're probably in your region working right now. And we would love to have local chambers involved. We've had a lot of local chamber partnership that's very active still to today and mm-hmm. have been since the, the start of 2018. And we always want more, always. I mean, we all have to be in it together. When you're asking employers to come to the table, they do what I did back in the day. They get PTSD. They're like, yes, thank you. Please invite me for another workforce thing where I'm never going to see any results of this work, right? Like, right. thanks for my exactly. Sandwich, have a good day. And it it's hard. I mean, we've all been burned by another workforce thing, another workforce thing, because it's just continual and everybody's trying to throw all they can at it. Um, but what we're seeing with talent pipeline management is very, very happy employers. They don't have to pay into the system other than their time and the resources that they put in actually that go direct to skilling up and educating if they put work, you know, any kind of resources and that goes directly to the earner and the work, the learner and the worker. Um, right. So th- we have very, we've, we have employers that love this system. Mm-hmm. Uh, the healthcare collaborative, we have, oh gosh, I'm going to misquote this. I feel like we had seven, we had seven of these collaboratives across the state. Um, and they now are starting to join as one combined statewide unit mm-hmm. rather than being regional. And then that we, we go where they want us to. That was at their request. Louisville was a very active uh, right. healthcare collaborative. Eastern Kentucky is amazing in their talent pipeline management work too. And they were kind of like, what's, what's Western Kentucky doing? What's, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And so they're, they're going to have their first healthcare summit coming up um, here in a couple of weeks. But they've built some really amazing solutions. Um, So one, the demand data that came out of Eastern Kentucky, what they figured out in Eastern Kentucky was, you know, it it wasn't that they necessarily needed to recruit more nursing students. They were losing the students they did have. So students were entering the program, dropping out, and they couldn't figure out why. And we dug into the data and what we figured out was It was life in Eastern Kentucky. It was childcare issues. It was transportation issues. You name it. It was hard, but those were the barriers. And so using talent pipeline management, we went for a grant and EKSEP was the recipient of this grant. And to, to, when we, we got over $2 million that will go into career connectors to support and give, provide transportation, childcare assistance, so that these individuals in Eastern Kentucky can go through the program, not drop out, accrue student debt, and not have a career. And so that was a unified decision by those healthcare employers there in the region to do it. Louisville's launching something incredibly cool. What they figured out was they needed more nurses, but they're missing they don't have enough students entering into the program. And when they get the students, they don't have enough rotation sites for the students to get hands on experience. So again, that was another example where we saw the employers come together, fix a solution through an automated technology where the schools and the employers and the students can just do the rotations and increase the number of those for students to get into the program. And and we think that that's got real promise, but you see solutions just like that popping up all over the state in these groups. And we always want more people. And, they, and none of those solutions would have come to fruition or even been thought of or are voiced if people hadn't been having these open conversations at this open table. I want people on this call to understand that, that this call isn't just about TPM. Don't get me wrong. This is a resource for you all to utilize. But I've been a part of some TPM meetings. Um, Beth's team has allowed me to tag along to some of our local chambers to, to hear what happens. And it's, and it's competition. It's like construction companies in Bardstown and they come together at a table and they're, they're, they're all in the same construction business. Yeah. 
you know, so they're, they used to think of themselves as competitors and like, they're going to keep their secrets close to their chest and they don't want to, they don't want anybody to leave their company to go to this company. They don't want you stealing their ideas. They don't want you to know what they're doing. They don't want you to understand their financials, you know, so some of that stuff is still private information, but they're coming to the table and they're letting down those walls. It's not so much silos anymore. They're letting down the walls and they're all discovering that they have like these same top five issues yeah. and that what one company, company A is doing something that company B or C never thought about doing, but now the B and C want to do it too. Now there's three companies that are trying to do this all together and oh my gosh, it's a difference. And if it takes some funding or if it takes some writing a grant or if it just takes just manpower and, and, and more people like calling on the governor or calling on the president or you know, you have this large group of people now that all have those same issues that they want to solve. And now that we've talked about it and we've had the communication, like we always talk about, that people feel like stuff is getting done. So this call isn't about all about TPM, but yeah. when we talk about resources that the Kentucky Chamber can offer local chambers and local communities, um, we run them through local chambers just because we have a great relationship with local chambers. But the community uses this. It's not you know, you can get chamber members from it, but it's not exclusive. It's just getting people to the table to talk. That's and, right. Um, and like you said, that grant, that $2 million grant was amazing. Um, and figuring out, you know, Eastern Kentucky has its share of issues. We feel like more than the rest of the state and figuring out that it's not so much that people don't want to work in Eastern Kentucky. There was just a lot more hardship getting to that end goal. And yeah. then we figured out that the end goal and we figure out a way to solve that. Where mm -hmm. one healthcare facility in Eastern Kentucky might not have been able to do it on their own. That's right. So that's, that's what's right. amazing about this. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. And the employer led the com they led the conversation and we listened and then did what we needed to do. But yeah, I mean, Tammy's point, like we're there to help. I mean, you can definitely think of us as an added resource, an added member of your team that helps on workforce. And we always want you all at the table. We love local chambers and when they're involved. So We'd be happy to help and in getting you engaged. What else do we need to know? I mean, that's I a lot of stuff. stuff. I mean, we've a lot of stuff. But, but I, I think, mean, yeah, I think what's coming. I, mean, I don't think this will be. Sorry, did I? Did no, I, I was just saying no. Okay, right, no, tell right. us. <laughs> I think what's coming, and you know, probably fasten the seatbelts for the next thing is that um, you know it, it's very likely and is looking likely the governor is going to release a, a work incentive program. Um, you know, all the murmurs we're hearing, it's it's definitely headed in that direction, and I I almost think we could expect that you know, to really be released very soon in the next week or two. Um, and so what that'll look like, a lot of Democratic governors have done this. You know, some, a lot of, we saw a lot of Republican governors just end the UI benefit, um, which interestingly enough, the data so far didn't show that they were that better off, mm -hmm. which... So, um, but other other states with with Democratic governors have done what we we call work incentive programs, return to work incentive programs. And so, what we'll see is, you know, we don't we don't know the details yet, but you'll see some sort of for those that are on UI right now that that return to work, they'll get some sort of return to work bonus. Um, and as time inches closer to you know that August end of August date, uh, that bonus will get smaller. So the incentive will be larger. The bonus will be larger the the sooner you get back to work um so we'll see you know it's it's like we said amy earlier it's like what are we going to see in september it's like I, we don't really know so we'll see what that does or, or doesn't do but hopefully it'll it'll give us a surge of workers coming back into the workplace gotcha yeah and that's it's interesting because it's unknown and that gives people you know sleepless nights I understand that and I know chambers get lots of questions because the chambers are about the business community so they want to know how the business community is going to survive I know right now it takes patience and um, for you all locally to continue that message about supporting local business and about helping you know run programs like TPM or local job fairs for your employers um, there's there's some great stuff that's been done um, I know the Mercer County Chamber and Lincoln County Chamber have done it a, a job shop thing together, but there's a, quite a few across the state that if you can help out your local employers, find that next great employee. Um, and then any continuing education that you can get from the state 
that we can offer locally as well if folks just need to be trained up. But I think it comes down to figuring out what your what your employers need. And TPM is perfect for that. The Workforce Center is perfect for that. The statistics that Beth talked about, um, there is a website for the Workforce Center. Beth, I don't know if you have that, if you want to stick I'll, that yeah, in, I'll, in, your, in the chat I'll box. put it in the chat. Yeah, happy to do okay, that. If you all want to link to what the Workforce Center has. Um, Beth, uh, does do she does go around and chat with chambers of commerce uh, much larger groups um, she's in Washington DC a lot as well just because our state was a pilot program when this all first started and we have the best TPM program in the country so that puts Beth um, on the hot seat quite a bit um, not only at the state level but at the federal level we're proud of her for that but also um, know that there is a lot of expertise and resource behind that so you can go straight to Beth. I'll, I'll put you in touch with her, but you can go straight to Beth. Um, she does work out at the Kentucky Chamber, of course. Um, also that their talent pipeline managers, like she mentioned, there are six of those. They're one assigned to your region and we can get you the right person if you're interested in that program um, for your community. Um, Workforce Center does stuff also with recovery and um, that fair chance hiring. We used to call it second chance hiring, but fair chance hiring about getting folks um, convicted felons, um, folks in active recovery, getting them back into the workplace and steps that can be taken to ensure that for your employer. So if you know of an employer this who's interested in that, who's try who is trying to do that, but might not have the resources you think they need, we can offer information on that as well. So it's a, it's a puzzle. We're trying to put the pieces together. And we want you guys to know that, um, uh, <laughs> we don't have all the answers, but we're trying to figure them out as well. Um, uh, Brittany Dawson is out of, uh, is out of, you can see it in the, in the chat box. She does the Southwest region. She's out of Bowling Green. Um, so if you all want to connect with Brittany, she's our TPM person over there. <laughs> Beth, Brittany in the house, she is. Um, but we, uh, we want to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, I know we've both talked quite a bit. I talked more than I thought I would, Beth, so I apologize. But, oh, it was um, great. It was a fun, it was a fun conversation. It really but I was. want you all, I want you all to have a chance to ask questions of Beth. If you want to post them in the chat box, um, we can read them out loud for people to see. Uh, Shanita Burchett, what do you all think is the best way to, for companies to retain potential employees, knowing they may not make as much going back into the workforce rather than staying home and receiving the UI check and bonus? So the best way for companies to retain the potential employees. Beth, what about that? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely um, Shawnee war for talent. It's pre-pandemic. It was like workforce challenge, right? Like we were, we knew it was severe, um, but coming out of this epidemic, um, it's a crisis. And I think we all as, as business leaders need to buckle up our seat that we're going to be here for a while. We, we weren't, we weren't great at workforce participation before the pandemic and we're, you know, we were 40th pre pandemic and we are, we're now 48. So it's not like we were ever good at it, but so we've, we, Kentucky's had some challenges. So, but to answer your question, like I'm retaining, I think that businesses have to take the retention uh, piece very seriously. And I think looking at their own retention um, within their organization and getting to the root causes of why they lose people is a very critical question for employers to understand. There is a lot of different retention uh, programs that are out there with, you know, making sure that employees have pathways to grow and develop. And so sometimes, as, you know, and I don't know if this is getting too specific, Shawnita, so so push me in a different path if, if I'm not hitting it. Um, but I mean, I think, you know, just employees like to make sure that, you know, hearing them and understanding what their, what their development wants to look like. And that doesn't always need, mean that they need to get a raise or another position. I mean, it should at some point, but it doesn't always mean that you need to give somebody a promotion or, or a raise or a new job title. It could mean understanding where their strengths and opportunities are and where they have opportunities going in and giving them coaching and development to overcome that. I think, being a boss and employee, it's a relationship just like any other, any relationship. And we value when we're cared for and we're valued when people care for us. And I think that there is a lot to be said about culture development coming out of this um, a lot, you know, where people are working from home, you know, engagement could go out the window or it could go up um, if you, if you take care of your employees. So I think there is a huge case to be made for, for developing culture and retention programs, getting to the root of what's wrong and then building off of it. 
I love that, Beth. It's not just that you pr are promised a raise or a promotion, mm -hmm. but what is your work environment? What do you what do you deal with? Like, what are your issues on a daily basis at your job? Mm -hmm. And how can those above you, your supervisor, your CEO, whoever, the person in charge, how can that person make that better? So it is, it's a relationship, it's communication. Um, and a lot of companies haven't had to really deal with it. They've had plenty of people applying for the jobs. They've been able to keep them if, they're, if their wage has been competitive or the benefits have been competitive. Not great, they're just competitive. And now it's like there's so many people that are out of the workforce and they're trying so hard to keep the ones that, that they have trained and that they appreciate and that are because it takes a whole lot more money and time to train up a new person. They want to keep that employee that's been there. Um, but now it's it's not that it's all in the employee's hands, but it is a good give and take where before I think it was uh, it was a lot more one sided. And if people can appreciate that, I think they'll see that retention comes a little bit smoother than just I'm the boss and I say so. You know, you, you can't I don't think you can do that anymore. Um, yeah. Cindy did say something in the in the chat box as well. Beth, did you see that she's they're up for work ready recertification, but she has zero support. So yeah. how, how do you go about, I mean, she really needs to get that. Her She believes that it's good for her community. How does she need to go, uh, any ideas on how to move forward with that? Well, one, Cindy, thanks for being the change agent there. Um, that's one deserves a huge amount of applause. I always say like in every community, it's not the same organization that makes the change. It's the person. And so sometimes within local communities, we'll see local chambers have that change agent. That's not going to take no for an answer. That's going to figure out how to work with others and get it done in other communities. It could be local community college. It could be, you know, it's, it's, it's the person that gets it done. So some of my um, advice, Cindy, in, in thoughts would be COVID was hard. It was really hard to get people to focus on big priorities, even like work ready. So it might be that we're now able to meet in person again. It's trying to get the group back together in person and seeing if you can get some traction there. I hate to be this blunt, but if you have people in the room that aren't moving the needle forward, are you in the wrong room? Um, and should you maybe look for other leaders, maybe within that organization that could also help you move the needle and, and get that certificate recertification done? Because it is really important. I think you've got to surround yourself and I don't mean to like be overly simplistic. So, so push back if this isn't answering the question, but I think you have to surprise, you need to surround yourself with other leaders that are the coalition of the willing that also want to get this done. If you keep hearing the no's, no, we shouldn't, but this, but that, I think you're in the wrong room. I think you got to go in a room where you either get business involvement of business leaders that are saying, yes, we should. Yes, we should. And then you can build that coalition of the willing where hopefully those that might be more resistant would be maybe more willing to listen when as those voices get louder. And I hope that was helpful, but please push back if not. And, and that is, Beth, like Cindy said, that's great advice, even when it comes to your board in general. I mean, mm -hmm. when you're talking about what your chamber goals, yeah. the mission, your strategic plan, business plan, whatever you call that, you don't need the no buts. You mean the yes, how can we, you know, yes, let's do this. And and if you feel like you're getting a lot of pushback just from your board members, um, then you you need you need the participants in that room to change. I mean, we can help you do that as well, but you know that moving forward, it's a collaborative effort. It's people who see the positivity in what's coming our way to be prepared. You know, reactive is really hard to come from. It's stressful to be reactive. We've got to figure out how we can be proactive um, and figuring out workforce issues. We seem a little reactive right now, but it's just because nobody knows. I think by figuring out, you know, who's in the room, who are your players in the room, and also employers that are willing to take that next step whether it's through talent pipeline or whether it's through coming to the table and understanding what issues are and how they can solve them together, um, then you're going to start feeling like you're proactive instead of reactive. Getting the board involved is a really, really big idea. While you're getting ready to read that next question, I have two more opportunities for those on the call if you if you all want to get involved. Um, one of them is our Who's Hiring Job Board. I'll post that here in a second. So for any of your members that are looking for a place to get talent, this is a free resource that we started during the pandemic. We've had 
over a hundred thousand job positions pushed mm -hmm. on that. We're creating a job seeker network. This gets marketed. These jobs get marketed and promoted heavily and it costs your chamber, not nothing. It costs, you, you know, businesses, nothing. We push it all over the state to those that um, are on UI and looking for a job. So it gets, it gets heavily, heavily promoted. So I will post that. The second opportunity as we, we look at next school year is bus to business. This is another free program uh, for, for you to get involved with. We know we leave too many Kentucky kids behind. We know Kentucky kids that we don't get enough experience when we're in sixth through 12th grade of what opportunities are out there post high school. If we were good at that, we would have more of our citizens getting post-secondary education and training. Bus to business this year gave 42,000 students work based learning opportunities and career exposure and experience. We did Workforce Wednesday every week where businesses taught a classroom to these students um, about different career fields in Kentucky. So we did every major industry sector, did demonstrations, talked about the education and training needed to, to be a part of that career field. This year, now that we're coming out of COVID and getting safer, <laughs> Um, we're going to be able to take the platform uh, back to field trip models. So we'll do four major field trips in each community a year within the school year and do virtual um Workforce Wednesdays where they get to to have the the online. So we'll go to a hybrid approach, and we also give your classrooms these posters about different career pathways that are really helpful. So we'd love you all to get involved with Bus to Business. You're going to hear more about it at the KCCE conference, mm -hmm. um, but that is another opportunity with who's hiring to to post those free jobs. So please get that out to your members, and then talk to us directly about getting involved with Bus to Business because we'd love to partner with you all on that. Yeah, I put both of those links in the chat Thank box you. if y'all want to click on those. Um, we affectionately call those folks that push our bus to business program our bus drivers. Um, and we are always actively recruiting bus drivers. Um, I look to local chamber professionals to do that in their community. Um, when we first started it, it was one day and we had, I don't know how many kids. That, that 1,200. So 1,200 kids. We had 1,200. Yeah. It was amazing. But this past year, we've had like over 10,000 kids involved. 42,000. 42,000. Sorry. Okay. So I missed the mark big on that one. But um, it, it's really, it's taking, uh, you know, when I was involved with it in person, it was a factory that was literally right next door to the high school in the community I was in. And mm -hmm. most of the kids didn't even know what that factory did. They knew the name of it because there's a sign out front, but that was it. And unless their parents work there, they only have like 40 or 50 employees. So it's very small, but it's a huge business. It's a multi-million dollar business for the community. So just having them walk in the front door and see people at work, talk to the HR manager about what it takes to get hired there, talk to the president, CEO, what the work environment's like. They got to talk to workers on their break. You know, they got to really like feel what it was like to work in that um, business. And um, most of the jobs there were not um, secondary, post-secondary education. It was a certification. Mm -hmm. Most of the workers there were welders and electricians. So the kids understood what, and they could ask them, like, what do they make? What are their benefits? They got to understand what that job meant. And for those of those kids on the trip that were like, I really don't feel like college is for me, right there in their hometown, in a building that they looked at their whole life was a job opportunity. And, and they were given like one, two, three steps on how they could get hired at that job. So it's amazing. Um, oh, firsthand, I mean, the virtual has been amazing too, but the in-person really made an impression on me. So that's a resource that you all can use as well. Mm -hmm. And like Beth mentioned, the who's hiring, that is heavily marketed. Amazing the jobs that you find on there. As KCCE and doing the executive search services for local chambers, I've used this service as well. It's been amazing how the word gets out about um, every kind of employment opportunity there is. So it isn't just for a specific sector of employment, it's for anybody and everybody who wants to use it. And those services are free. So don't forget about well, that. Well, that's definitely a superpower every chamber leader has on this call. I'm sure we don't know how to be quiet. Like that's not our, if to be a chamber leader, like you have to be loud. And so we are very loud about our job board. So yeah. please. Yeah. Send it out. And it works. It's obvious yeah. it works. It's been so successful. And the job seeker stuff that's coming up soon, it's just going to be amazing. So we appreciate Beth. Your I know Harper's been instrumental on that. For those of you who know Harper Smith, yeah. she's amazing. And she's the whole, it's like it's a big old team effort. Again, I yeah. just get to smile and say nice things, but there's a <laughs> good team that actually makes all this beautiful stuff happen. Exactly. All right. What other questions do we have before we go? It's been a marathon, I understand. 
drinking from the fire hose, which is what we usually do as chamber professionals anyway. But does anybody have any other questions before we go? I see one from Shawnita and Shawnita, I'm sh no. She was just saying that she. Uh, but I was, oh, okay, she, okay, we got it. Gotcha, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, good. Wasn't a question, but she was, and we're glad you're on the call, Shanita. Anyway, any way we can be more educated to help our business leaders, the better off we all are. That's for certain. Because you all know over the last 15 months, have you not learned? If they don't know the answer, um, uh, they come to the chamber first because we seem to have the answers to the questions, which has been wonderful, but also a little uh, stressful as well. Anybody else got any qu more questions for Miss Beth? I know we're finishing up just a few minutes early, and I know you all will appreciate that. Go take the last five minutes or so and enjoy the beautiful outdoors. Um, like I mentioned before, this has been recorded, so you all can find this on our KCCE YouTube channel. It does take a little bit for me to upload it, so give me a day before you find it, but you can share it with folks on your staff or your board members or business leaders in your community if you would like to utilize it for uh, other programs that you offer locally at your chamber. You are welcome to do that. That's a service that KCC and the Kentucky Chamber give to you um, to give you more resources at your fingertips. Um, be in mind that we do have a Mondays with Mickey next Monday with uh, Tom Rubleski. Um, he is a, uh, a best-selling author and motivational speaker. Y'all be interested to hear him. And next week, also be on the lookout. Registration opens for KCC Annual Conference. So we hope you guys will um, come for that um, September 30th and October 1st in person. Yes, Yay. yes, in person at the Kentucky Chamber. Um, we were so excited to see you in person and also to show off our new building. Our building's under construction right now. And the goal is to have it completely finished by the time you all will be the first guests <laughs> to see the new building. So we're excited about that as well. So we'll be looking out for um, the Mondays with Mickey on Monday, the um, uh, link to register for annual conference next week. And also there'll be application for our annual awards will come out next week as well. So busy, busy. Um, contact us if you need anything. Beth is B. Davison. And KY Chamber, super easy, just like me, A Cloud at KY Chamber. Um, Y'all know you can reach me on my phone. If you can't find Beth, I'll find her for you. Um, and let us know how else we can help. And as always, thank you for joining us um, for our KCC Lunch and Learn. And Beth, thank you, thank you, thank you, as always, dear friend, for sharing your expertise with us. And we look forward to seeing you and your team at our conference um, in September. So thanks a lot. And you guys have a wonderful thank day. You. Thank you all. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, that was guys. really fun. All right, bye.